the start of uh, paying respects to the Buddha, first bow, second bow, third bow. So first page of the chanting book. <coughs> Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutatsa Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutatsa Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutatsa Buddhang saranang gachami, tamang saranang gachami, sanghang saranang gachami, dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami, dutiyampi tamang saranang gachami, Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami The next page, the Vandana. Iti piso bhagava arahang sama sambuto Vijja charana sampano sugato no kavinu Anu taru purisadama sarati Satha deva manutsana puto bhagavati Swakato Bhagavata Thambho Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko Opanaiko Pachatam Vedita Bovinyohiti Supatipano Bhagavato Sahavaka Sangho Ujjupatipano Bhagavato Sahavaka Sangho Yaya Patipano Bhagavato Sahavaka Sangho Samiji Patipano Bhagavato Sahavaka Sangho Yadidanjata Ripurisa Yugadi Atta Purisa Pukara Esa Bhagavato Sahavaka Sangho Abuneyo Pabuneyo Dakineyo Anjali Karaniyo Anutaram Punya Kitang Loka Sati So we're going to turn to this Mangala Sutta eh? Great discourse on good fortune. Thus have I heard. One time the exalted one was living near Sawati in Jeta's grove, the monastery of Anatta Pindika. Then, in the middle of the night, a certain deity astounding beauty, lighting up the entire Jeta's grove, approached the exalted one, drawing near. He paid homage to the Exalted One and stood to one side. Standing thus, the deity addressed the Exalted One in verse. Many deities and men have pondered on good fortune, desiring their well-being. Tell me the highest good fortune. Not to associate with the foolish, to associate with the wise, to honour those worthy of honour. This is the highest good fortune. Residing in a suitable locality, to have done merit in the past, to set oneself in the right direction, this is the highest good fortune. Vast learning, 
perfect handicraft, a good discipline for training, a well-uttered speech. This is the highest good fortune. The supporting of father and mother, cherishing of wife and children, and peaceful occupations. This is the highest good fortune. It's 13. Eh? Giving, righteous conduct, the helping of relatives, and blameless actions. This is the highest good fortune. Seizing and abstaining from evil, avoiding intoxicating drinks, diligence in virtuous practices. This is the highest good fortune. Reverence and humility, contentment and gratitude, timely hearing of the Dhamma. This is the highest good fortune. Patience and obedience and seeing of spiritual men. Timely discussions on the Dhamma. This is the highest good fortune. Austerity, the holy life, seeing the noble truths and realization of Nibbana. This is the highest good fortune. A mind unshakable when touched by the changes of worldly states. Sorrowless, stainless and secure. This is the highest good fortune. Those who have fulfilled all this are everywhere invincible. They find well-being everywhere. These are the highest good fortune. By the power of this truth, may joyous victory be mine. <clears throat> okay, so we turn to the dedication chant, page 7. <clears throat> Transference of merit to the devas. Akasata chapumata devanaga mahitika punyantang anubodhitva tirang rakantu loka sasana akasata chapumata devanaga mahitika punyantang anubodhitva tirang rakantu desana Akasata Japumata Devanaga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditwa Sirang Rakatu Mampara Page 9 Blessing to the World Devo Vasatu Kalena Sasa Sampati Hetuja Pito Pawatu Lokoja Raja Pavatu Dhamiko Transference of Merits to Departed Idam Binyati Nang Hotu Sukita Hontu Nyatayo Idam Binyati Nang Hotu Sukita Hontu Nyatayo Idam Binyati Nang Hotu Sukita Hontu Nyatayo Aspiration Imina Ponya Kamina Mami Bala Samagamo, Satang Samagamo Hotu, Yavati Bana Patiya. Asking for pardon. Kayena Vacha Chitena, Pamadena Mayakata, Achayan Kamami Pante, Uri Panya Tatagata, Kayena Vacha Chitena. Pamadena Mayagata, Ajayan Kamami Dhamma, Sanditika Akalika, Kayena Vacha Chitena, Pamadena Mayagata, Ajayan Kamami Sangha, Supati Pana Anutara, Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. Okay, so tonight uh, is on either talk or Q and A. Thank you. There's no issues. Okay, then we can talk on this uh, Mangala Sutta, yeah? page eleven. <clears throat> so we have read uh, in English earlier on this uh, Maha Mangala Sutta, the discourse on blessings. So in Religion in general, right, including Buddhism, <clears throat> a lot of times people think blessing means uh, something miraculous. 
uh, either the monk bestow you <laughs> the blessing or some divine figure they bestow you the blessing. Uh, actually, in the teachings here, somehow it's no, it's more of a ground up approach. It's what you do to create your own blessings. Yeah, to create your own blessings. So a person can go to any temple and they can wish any Buddha, Bodhisattva, or any deity, any kind of thing, no? All kinds of things. Wish good fortune, 40 number, anything, right? <clears throat> so it may not be uh, spiritual in nature, may not be religious in nature. Sometimes people ask for material things, material things, which is uh, actually quite contrary to most religions. Eh? Most religions teach us to become a more selfless person, eh? become more generous, more kind. And uh, you know, sometimes the way we wish is the other way around. Eh? Um, but uh, the good thing is uh, it does bring some kind of uh, emotional solace, eh? emotional kind of solitude for those people in trouble so that's like the minimal kind of thing but if your person want to proceed further how to generate their own happiness generate their own wealth or generate their own uh, all those stuff right <clears throat> is in these blessings here uh, then what are the things to do so even heavenly beings may not know the answer <clears throat> yeah, heavenly beings may not know the answer so these heavenly beings came down and asked the Buddha, you know, what is this blessing about? <clears throat> yeah, not, not all of them know. Right? So some people uh, <clears throat> ask for you know, ask for things. Uh, not all deities are, uh, how do you call it, all powerful. Yeah? So some of them have limitations, some of them work in certain departments, they do certain things. And if whatever we wish can manifest and become true, then we are Maybe better than the deities. Yeah? Whatever you wish can come true, then we are better than the deities. Uh, so, <clears throat> so that's not the idea. So probably those deities in heaven were having a discussion. What is blessings about? Because so many humans are praying to them, praying and praying. Then uh, they want to know the answer. Yeah? So one of them came down and asked the Buddha this question. Huh? What is this blessing? So the Buddha's uh, first response uh, is the second point, eh? second pointer, not to associate with the fools, to associate with the wise. Okay, so this is the first teaching, not to associate the fools. That means people who engage in a lot of uh, unwholesome activities, and then we avoid them. Uh, of course, uh, you cannot find a perfect person. Eh? Uh, there will be some people uh, you have to see. Overall, if they are uh, quite positive, then it's okay. Uh, if, let's say, there's a bit of bad habits, you can avoid that for that moment. So, in um, to associate the wise, yeah? associate those who are wholesome. So, this is the first teaching. So, there is this... Uh, saying, we are what we become. No. Whoever we associate, we become. Yeah, so the friends uh, or the company, the company we sort of hang around, will make us a certain person. So if a person likes to hang around with maybe gamblers or drunkards, then the whole conversation is uh, relating to this topic. Right, so sooner or later you'll be peer pressured into uh, drinking and gambling. Right, so that's the peer pressure. So it's good to, uh, I would say, find case by case basis. Uh, that means any unwholesome activity we try to avoid or we totally avoid. That's why we observe the precepts. So in the precepts, there is no mention of gambling, eh, but gambling. Uh, is considered a vice, eh? is considered a vice in Buddhism. So any unwholesome activity, uh, please avoid. Then uh, you need to go to wholesome activities. For example, like maybe coming here, right? <clears throat> so associate the wise or people who are wholesome.
to honor those worthy of honor. This is the highest good fortune. Okay, so if a person honor or respect uh, people with great virtues, great qualities, at least psychologically, you are making that person a role model. A role model. So you're actually imitating or following uh, some or at least you know, most of some of the footsteps. So this is uh, one of the good pointers. Yeah? So somehow this is not in the Buddhist teaching only, but also in, I think, some motivational coach or success coach. They also kind of teach this kind of thing. Eh? That means don't associate with bad company. <clears throat> okay, uh, number three. Residing in a suitable locality to have done merit in the past. Okay, so a person is able to be sort of born or to reside in a, maybe a relatively peaceful place is due to certain merit we've done in the past. Yeah, so that's why we, we are not having war right now. Yeah? So unlike certain place, uh, kind of bomb all the time. <clears throat> so uh, you have to be grateful for uh, the current conditions. Uh, then to not be easily contented with uh, the merits you have now. So you need to continue to do good. Eh? To set oneself in the right direction. Because all these good karmas will be used up. Be used up. So you create more. So you send yourself in the right direction. Okay, then number four. Vast learning. Perfect handicraft. A good discipline for training. A well-uttered speech. And this is the highest blessing. <clears throat> okay, so number four talks about mundane skill set. Mundane skill set. For you to survive. And survive in the world. Or... Uh, mundane duties so it's not just not just a lay person uh, monks also need to learn yeah? need to learn not just uh, giving talks uh, memorize chanting uh, we need certain skill yeah? because let's say in the large monastery uh, sometimes monks need to be assigned duties to manage the monastery you know somebody need to keep stock of the items uh, know how to Maybe in a forest monastery, they even uh, do handicraft work. How to make brooms, uh, how to make bowl, how to make the iron bowl, do casting and stuff like that. So all these need skill, handicraft. Yeah? So if a person totally no skill and nothing, yeah, and, and nothing, then basically you cannot run the place. You'll be just sitting around and doing nothing, right? So, um, so it's good to have some skill so that... Uh, we can sort of be useful and sort of coexist. Okay, well, utter speech. So it's important to observe right speech as mentioned on the first day when you're here. Okay, then number five, supporting of father and mother, cherishing of wife and children. Okay, so this is got to do with family. Huh? So taking care of family, uh, very important. Taking care of parents, so talk about uh, uh, filial piety, gratitude, and also uh, responsible, huh? being responsible to the family members. Very important. Um, peaceful occupations. So this part of right livelihood. <clears throat> so I think on the first day we never cover huh? the Noble Eightfold Path. There's this thing called right livelihood. So there's like a certain job or occupation uh, which is sort of encouraged by the Buddha as long as it's honest living. As long as it's honest living, then it's okay. So, um, but there are five kind of trait which is uh, discouraged. Discouraged in the Buddha's time. So the first kind of trait is <coughs> avoid trading in weapons. Anything that kills. Yeah. So that's the first kind of... Uh, uh, trade to avoid if you have this kind of occupation. Uh, this kind of occupation to avoid is huge, um, 
trading in living beings. It can be human trafficking, animal trafficking, as long as they're alive and you sort of you know, move them around. So that is the second kind of trade to avoid. <clears throat> the third kind of trade to avoid is trading in meat. Trading in meat. So uh, indirectly, the Buddha might be promoting vegetarianism. Uh, so for a lay person not to buy and sell meat, not to trade in meat. Eh? So in certain Buddhist countries, if they are promoting uh, strongly vegetarianism, then a lot of these, uh, I mean those butchers and whatever, will be lesser and lesser. Eh? <clears throat> um, and the fourth kind of trade is trade in poison. Trade in poison, things like uh, insecticide, pesticide and so on anything that kills and the fifth kind of trade is avoid trading in intoxicants things like alcohol and uh, kind of abusive or recreational drugs so we try to avoid uh, these five kinds of trade uh, at least for a lay person <coughs> so for monks we have more eh? <laughs> more likely good thing okay so i don't want to mention <coughs> um, Okay, then the next page, so point number six. So at any point, if you have any issues or questions, can, can ask questions. Eh? Okay, number six, giving righteous conduct and helping of relatives and blameless actions. This is the highest good fortune. Okay, so first, before that, we talk about helping your own family members. Then once you are able to sustain your family unit, then you go on to giving. But it's not uh, unlike the Jataka stories. <laughs> Give until your your own personal family bankrupt. So this one is uh, very contrary. So <clears throat> uh, the Buddha's teaching talks about uh, taking care of your own family first. Then once you are self-sufficient, then you give. Eh? righteous conduct and helping of relatives so then you slowly extend out <laughs> blameless actions yeah so this talk about your right action right speech this is the highest good fortune and number seven seizing and abstaining from evil avoiding intoxicant drinks uh, in diligence in virtuous practice Okay, so this one is uh, very obvious, so what we are doing in the retreat, avoid all unwholesome uh, body, speech and mind. Uh, avoid this alcohol, religion, and virtuous practices. So this part of right effort, uh, promoting wholesome qualities. So right effort is defined as uh, the four kinds of right efforts. So effort is not about pushing and forcing, uh, so no. Right effort is more on repetition and uh, consistency so there are four kinds of things uh, the first one is uh, if a person has unwholesome qualities such as greed and anger then you can try to overcome them and reduce and overcome them so that is the first kind of right effort second kind of right effort is if you do not have unwholesome qualities eh, these uh, Greed and anger hasn't arisen yet. Ah, they're very good. Don't let it arise. Don't let it arise. So that's the second kind of right effort. And the third kind of right effort is to do with wholesome qualities. If you do not have wholesome qualities, such as maybe loving kindness, compassion, and you try to generate them, uh, trying to develop them. So that's the third kind of effort. And the fourth kind of right effort is if you already have wholesome qualities and you try to maintain them try to maintain and try to perfect them so that's the four kinds of right effort okay then number eight point number eight reverence and humility contentment and gratitude timely hearing of the dhamma this is the highest good fortune okay reverence and humility uh, so this whole point number eight eh, is got to do with uh, <coughs> uh, not just receiving 
Dhamma but uh, kind of human qualities in general so it's good to uh, so called show uh, be you know be hum how you call it? have humility eh? that means do not be too proud uh, to uh, show off and reverence means uh, showing respect to uh, those who are worthy of respect or those who you wish to learn from that you respect contentment and gratitude that means uh, first you need to establish a baseline what is really a need and what is excessive wanting right? so once you establish what you really need then whatever you seek will be considered a necess necessity right? if a person do not have contentment and everything they want and everything they want to to sort of uh, expand their energy to learn uh, channel their energy to learn to seek to whatever then it becomes uh, over drink eh? <clears throat> okay timely hearing of Dhamma so in this case um, if a person let's say revere uh, let's say the Buddhist uh, revere the Buddha or any Buddhist teacher um, there's protocol for teaching Dhamma actually. Eh? There's sometimes um, <clears throat> people think uh, the Dhamma, right? Giving the Dhamma is the highest gift. Have you heard of this statement before? The highest gift is the Dhamma. I have, eh? So some people hear this statement, eh? wow, giving Dhamma is the highest gift. So the mouth <laughs> become like uh, <coughs> non-stop, eh? like become radio, like the whole day tape recorder no? keep playing teaching and teaching and teaching <laughs> or whole day they keep spamming spamming messages or they forward whatsapp uh, dhamma quotes like uh, whole day you know whole day spamming so that is become devaluing the dhamma and devaluing the dhamma so dhamma actually need to revere and respect so we <coughs> um in order to receive Dhamma teaching, you need to request. You need to request. Right? So if there's like a demand and supply thing. So when there's a demand, when the audience or a listener want to learn, then the, whoever is teaching, then they will teach. So that's like a demand supply. So the Dhamma will have value. Yeah? The Dhamma will have value. <clears throat> so in this case, this is... Uh, uh, so called planned program huh, this Dhamma talk so, so I speak <clears throat> but in most cases if there's no program normally in the monastery setting the monks just <laughs> go do their own normal chores huh? we'll just like sort of ignore or some lay people will think how come the monk never give teaching one? the monk just walk away right? <laughs> just like never give any sermon so you all need to request you all need to go up to the monk and Say, uh, Bhante, are you free? Can I ask you a question? So, you need to request. So, once you request, then the, the Bhante, if they are available, then they will answer your question. Eh? So, there must be an <coughs> invitation, a request. So, if there's no request, then the, the monk will not become like a Dhamma salesman. Eh? He won't go to the coffee shop table to table, then show you the Dhamma book. Hey, you must believe in the triple gem. Eh? If not, you'll be reborn in the three lower realm. Something like that. So if you do that, then a lot of people will dislike Buddhism. Eh? They will start to turn away. So we try not to do that. Um, so that's why uh, lay people may not be aware. So for monks, we have 16 monastic rules with regard to teaching Buddhism. Eh? With sharing Buddhism. We have 16 rules. So all this got to do with... Uh, like the kind of respect. Uh, so some example uh, is if a person is holding a weapon, you cannot teach them Dhamma. So it's a metaphorical example. If a person is aggressive, if a person is hostile, then you cannot teach them. If you teach them already, then they get angry with you. So, uh, so that's one of the reasons. Another rule we have is uh, if a person 
is holding a walking stick. You cannot teach them the Dhamma. That means if a person is older than you, you cannot teach them unless they make the request. Yeah? Uh, because if you start teaching them when they're not ready, then they'll be thinking, hey, I eat salt more than you eat rice. <laughs> Yeah, I've gone through more life experience than you. Who are you to teach me, right? So, something like that. And same thing, there are so many um, other uh, rules got to do with social status. If somebody's social status is higher than you, uh, maybe your boss, or maybe somebody in a higher position, uh, you also cannot teach them. Uh, somebody egoistic, if somebody is uh, maybe standing or seated higher than you, we cannot teach them. Uh, that means showing ego, eh? something like that. So in short, we cannot teach unless there is a request. So if there's no invitation, no request means there's no demand. Eh? That means you are not interested. We take it as you're not interested, so we don't share. Right? But nowadays, uh, I think with technology, uh, things are more convenient. So like now, they want to upload on, on YouTube. So... Uh, sooner or later I'll be out of business um, so you can just go to YouTube and just watch eh? so that's the technology <clears throat> okay um, point number nine patience and obedience and seeing of spiritual men timely discussions on Dhamma oh very similar eh? <laughs> okay patience and obedience um so a person, patience is important huh? because sometimes uh, not every speaker can be very entertaining. Like myself, I'm not so entertaining. Huh? Some speaker more entertaining. So sometimes monks, huh, they give the speech uh, very monotonous. Very monotonous. In fact, most monks, when they sort of like, if they're grown up in a monastery, they don't have courses for public speaking. So they just talk law, they just like normal conversation. Normal conversation. And sometimes can be very boring. And when that happens, um, then you get very frustrated. So as a lay person during my time, I face a similar situation. So it might be karmic kind of uh, recipro reciprocity. Eh? Um, my dad was following this uh, Tibetan Buddhism last time. Tibetan Buddhism. So last time he brought me along, so he took refuge and the five precepts under the Tibetan tradition. And at that time, the Lama cannot speak English. Cannot speak English. So all those uh, overseas monks that come also cannot speak English. So they need to invite a uh, translator. Translator. So usually there's like a Caucasian kind of monk, so he will uh, translate. So the Lama will teach in uh, Tibetan, and the translator will sort of try his best to translate English. And a lot of times it's like, <laughs> um, both my dad and myself, we become a bit impatient, because they translate very long, or sometimes the Lama talk very slow. Then uh, some of the content is sort of like, filtered away. Eh? You get less of the content uh, of the translated version. So my dad sort of uh, switched me to a Sri Lankan kind of meditation course. So he stopped me from uh, attending the Tibetan tradition kind of Dhamma talk. And then he just sent me to this Sri Lankan tradition. So I end up I become Theravada. Eh? So uh, it might be a good thing, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, it's good to have patience so you can learn, uh, learn as much as possible. Obedience, obedience means uh, following instructions. Following instructions. So it's important to uh, have these qualities. So obedience uh, is not blind obedience. Eh? So in Buddhism, we also talk about uh, seeking the right teacher, have certain level of critical thinking to investigate. So if the instruction makes sense, it's like not harmful, and by all means, you follow the instruction. By the instruction, you think hey, something is wrong, huh? not right, then it, you can actually question, huh? question the 
uh, teacher asks or clarify uh, why why you know, do you give this instruction and the whole idea is not to follow blindly eh? okay so obedience uh, seeing or spiritual men timely discussions of dhamma is same eh? this is the highest good fortune Okay, austerity, the holy life, seeing the noble truth, and realization of Nibbana. This is the highest good fortune. <clears throat> okay, so this one uh, is for people who want to uh, renounce. Yeah? Austerity, holy life, seeing the noble truth. At least for the first line, austerity and holy life. So some people think holy life means uh, you put on the robes and this is a holy life. Actually, it depends a lot on the mental and other activities. A person may be physically going through the physical routine, they follow the temple schedule, but the mind is not living like a Brahma. The mind has still have a lot of sensual desires, still have to seek or you look at advertisement or new handphone, new product, and you want to buy this, want to buy that, then that is not really living like a renunciant, eh? not the real kind of austerity. It's just physical austerity, but doesn't roll onto the mind. So as long as the mind is really contented, then that is a real kind of uh, holiness, real kind of austerity. Okay, then seeing the noble truths. Yeah, so the whole idea is to see the noble truths. So for a lay person, uh, also can can see the truth. But monk is like full time, huh? supposedly full time commitment. <clears throat> it's just like, for example, um, I give an example, maybe a sport, let's say badminton. Badminton. Some people play for hobby. Some people play full time as a profession. Is it true to say all professional players are better than hobby playing badminton players? No, uh, not necessarily true. Some people who play for hobby can be very talented. Or maybe previously they, they were professional, then they retired. So we call this past life cultivation. <laughs> past life cultivation. They, they, they are not in the line, but they are very talented, very good. Or some people um, really, you know, learn the trade, everything, but they are unable to join the profession for whatever reason. Maybe the association don't accept them. But they really learn everything in the trade. Learn the, all the skill, learn the technique. So they're very good. Right? So... Um, uh, so everybody's condition is different, right? So the whole idea is um, uh, as long as we follow the uh, Noble Eightfold Path as much as possible, then it's possible to see this uh, Nibbana. Okay, a mind unshakable when touched by the changes of worldly states. Sorrowless, stainless, secure. This is the highest good fortune. Okay, so this is the equanimity we are talking about. Right, so Nibbana is the uh, highest kind of equanimity, unshaken. Those who have fulfilled all these are everywhere invincible. Huh? So this is the um, for those who have fulfilled everything. So that's the end of the sharing.